Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jeff Newman and Jana Russ from Thompson & Coburn, and we are pleased to be with you today to discuss with you the Trade Agreements Act. The title of our program is a tough act to follow, how to comply with the Trade Agreements Act. Well, we thank, uh, we thank the many of you for spending uh, an hour to 90 minutes with us today regarding the Trade Agreements Act. Um, and what I'd like to sort of go over real briefly is what we intend to talk about today. Uh, the first question is, you know, why should you care about the Trade Agreements Act? This is one of the hottest areas of compliance in government contracts, as we'll talk about today in a few moments. Uh, this is an area where not only the Department of Justice, but agencies are cracking down on contractor noncompliance, whether it's intentional or inadvertent. And it's one area that uh, contractors need to be really aware of as they formulate and implement their compliance programs in the government contracting area. The Trade Agreements Act is a complex statute, has a, is a complex statute and the accompanying body of regulations uh, that we will hopefully be able to demysticize for you today uh, in your government contracts. Uh, there's a lot of uh, mistaken beliefs about how the Trade Agreements Act either should be applied to a contract or whether it should be applied to a contract, and we'd like to go through that with you today as well. In addition, uh, one of the things that we hope to share with you toward the end of the presentation is what should you be doing as contractors to minimize or eliminate your risk of liability under the Trade Agreements Act, and what policies and procedures should you have in place at the company level and with your employees to make sure that you are a compliant company with respect to Trade Agreements Act uh, and other uh, related requirements. Knowing all this, um, uh, how do you address the Trade Agreements Act difficulties or issues if they arise during contract performance? What is it you can do as a contractor to, as, once, as I said before, mitigate or eliminate any risk? Uh, but uh, as you know, uh, uh, these issues will sometimes arise well after you've become involved in them, well after you, uh, uh, you sort of uh, uh, arrived on the scene, and therefore uh, now it's your job to clean up the, the, the so-called Trade Agreements Act mess. So we hope to sort of walk you through some of those scenarios as, as well today. Your customers care about the Trade Agreements Act, um, you know, whether it's the GSA, which is uh, an, uh, an agency that's uh, significantly involved in scrutinizing uh, contract compliance with the Trade Agreements Act, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, uh, all agencies today are looking at the um, uh, Trade Agreements Act compliance. Uh, in particular, the GSA sent letters out to thousands of contractors earlier this year. Uh, asking them to certify their compliance with the Trade Agreements Act and analyze their source of supply to ensure compliance. Uh, that's a significant um, uh, obligation uh, for contractors to certify their compliance to a uh, federal uh, regulatory requirement. A failure to certify properly could lead to both civil and or criminal liability. And so uh, those contractors that received those letters had to certify whether they were compliant. And if they were uh, non-compliant uh, and they certified that they were, that's a big problem. If they're non-compliant, uh, they would have had to clean up their uh, Trade Agreements Act difficulties uh, and inform uh, GSA that this was a, a problem. Uh, the Trade Agreements Act also can be difficult to uh, understand and comply with. Uh, there is requires um, much coordination uh, among many different uh, company departments, uh, purchasing, procurement, uh, legal, uh, compliance, contracts, program management, and there are others as well that we see on a regular basis among our clients. Uh, when you ask a trade agreement that question, we often find that some of those departments are well aware of the statute and accompanying regulations, others are clearly not. So this is an area where the Trade Agreements Act really needs to be um, uh, uh, embedded within, within the company's uh, understanding as they sort of perform their government contracts. TAA violations are regularly disclosed by contractors to Inspector General's offices. Uh, the Inspector General will then come out and review the situation to see if further action or reimbursement is warranted. We're also seeing a lot of Trade Agreements Act uh, cases come as um, a False Claims Act uh, 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 disclosures under KETAM where a, a, a current employee or perhaps a former disgruntled employee brings an action under the False Claims Act, and, and that's how the government becomes aware of this situation, and the government will intervene in the case. Um, and we could talk about that a little bit later on as well. 
All of this leads to uh, expensive and unwanted consequences as a government contractor. Certainly, many of you are familiar with suspension and debarment as a death knell to doing your government contracts business. Uh, uh, certainly, the public relations issues, uh, you have your reputation, and the last thing a company, uh, I believe, wants to see today is their sort of company profiled on the front page of the Washington Post or Wall Street Journal. Uh, New York Times, LA Times, about a, a Trade Agreements Act problem or trying to, quote, unquote, defraud the U.S. government by not sourcing your um, supplies or services properly. Uh, contract terminations. Uh, you know, a contract can be terminated if, in fact, the government uh, feels that uh, it no longer wants to do business with you as a contractor. Uh, government claims can be filed for offsets or reimbursements to to the, uh, 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 the Trade Agreements Act violation. So if a company overbilled the government $2 million in light of the Trade Agreements Act violation, the government wanted, may see $2 million back uh, in, in the Treasury, plus fines, plus penalties and, and um, uh, other costs associated with that. And certainly settlements. Uh, the government has uh, recently settled a number of high-profile Trade Agreements Act cases. We're seeing more and more of that today, um, and that leads to our next slide, which is some examples of uh, these Trade Agreements Act terminations. Uh, and you can see the agencies on which they were settled with. Most are with GSA. As I mentioned before, GSA is one of the primary agencies scrutinizing the Trade Agreements Act today. Uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the GSA Schedule Contract Program, other than the price reduction clause, where you have to provide the government with a most favored uh, customer pricing, uh, this is the second most area uh, that the GSA is looking at for compliance, right after that price reduction clause um, uh, set of uh, uh, regulations. Um, in, in addition, when you look at these settlements, uh, these are just the amounts that were settled. Chances are that the GSA and other agencies on this sheet here uh, were looking for a lot more money in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, rectifying a trade agreement that problem at the outset. And once again, these are just a few of the settlements that we that we picked for you. Those, if uh, you could do a Google search and come up with a, trim, uh, a significant amount uh, of other settlements. Um, and I would actually just add really quickly that. As you'll see there on that list of settlements we have, that it really covers a cross range of products too, that it's not really one area or one industry that's being targeted here. It covers everything from hardware to computers to medical equipment. So it really does cover multiple industries and not just one industry. And I, and I should mention as a, as a conclusion on this slide, and, and uh, we appreciate the many of you who are on the call on this webinar uh, attending, uh, I don't see anybody from Oracle, so perhaps I could say this with, with uh, a, a, a little bit more freedom, but Oracle just announced and is publicly um, stated in, in the trade press that they are getting out of the GSA schedule contracting program in its entirety, not only directly selling under the GSA schedule program, but also through third-party resellers. And uh, although they had some price reduction uh, settlements with the government uh, and some False Claims Act settlements with the government, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's also likely that the Trade Agreements Act and, and a host of other compliance obligations that they had with GSA factored into that decision. So with that as a backdrop, I think it's important to understand what is the Trade Agreements Act. And, you know, in putting these slides to deck together, we were trying to sort of synthesize the, 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 the essence of the Trade Agreements Act down as, as, as concisely as possible. And we came up with the first bullet here, and that is the Trade Agreements Act simply prohibits the U.S. government from acquiring end products or services if the products or services do not constitute U.S.-made or designated country end products um, absent an exemption from the particular restriction. And there's a lot of words in that, you know, five or so lines that's on the slide in front of you. Uh, and each of these words, frankly, has meaning. Um, uh, the prohibits, this is a, a, a prohibition statute. It's not a preference like we see in many other government contract programs. Um, products and services are will be defined terms on, on how those apply to the, the, the Trade Agreements Act. U.S. made or designated con country end products, uh, you know, are also important because they'll help serve as an, a potential exemption or carve out from the from the statute. 
Uh, and there's other exemptions as well based on particular types of products or services that have been listed in the Federal Acquisition Regulation. And all these regulations are really under FAR Part 25. Um, uh, if you have that uh, either CFR handy or the, the standalone Federal Acquisition Regulation, you'll find all the regulations relating to the Trade Agreements Act in FAR Part uh, 25. One thing to bear in mind is the Trade Agreements Act is not intended to deal with counterfeit parts. Uh, far, that FAR Part 25 that I referenced has its own counterfeit parts subsection. So uh, that's not what the Trade Agreements Act is about. It's not about the Buy America Act as well or the Buy American Act. Uh, this is really a separate statute that uh, thankfully for many contractors trumps the Buy America statutes uh, and requirements because of the international trade agreements that the United States has entered into. As I said, not dealing with counterfeit parts, not dealing with cybersecurity either. We have some new regulations that just came down from the Department of Defense on that very issue, but these, these regulations do not deal with the Trade Agreements Act. Those deal entirely with cybersecurity. And with, the, uh, with that, as I said, as a, as a further backdrop, let me turn it over to my colleague to lead you through a number of the slides starting with the history of the Trade Agreements Act. And since we have 90 minutes, we'll take the next 85 minutes to talk about the history uh, of the Trade <laughs> Agreements Act, and then we'll, we'll sort of finish up uh, with everything else. But let me turn it back over to Jana, who will, who will, who will uh, clearly abridge what I just said. <laughs> and this, luckily for you all, will not be 85 minutes of the history, but we wanted to provide some of the history for you all so that you have an idea of really what the Trade Agreements Act requirements are, and to understand that, we really do think you need to understand the history because there are going to be some nuances here, and I think there is some confusion that we've seen when we talk to contractors, and so knowing the history will help clear up some of that confusion for you all. And so we're going to start back in the 1870s, <laughs> and that's when the U.S. passed its first law preferring American-made product or American materials in government contracts and projects. And that mindset continued after the 1870s, but really increased during the Depression. And as you can imagine, during the Depression, folks were really eager to keep American dollars here within the U.S. They were really eager to make sure that the federal government was spending its money with U.S. companies. And that's when the, what we now know as the Buy American Act was passed. That was in 1933. And it's been revised multiple times since then, but it remains the same in spirit. Essentially, the act requires, or I'm sorry, it establishes a preference for the acquisition of American-made articles, materials, and supplies. And so you'll see there that we stress the word preference, and that really is what the Buy American Act is. But then as the U.S. and other countries came outside of the Depression, we moved on to the 1970s and bell bottoms and all of that fun stuff. And um, many other countries, as the United States started to do um, global trade, the U.S. found that many other countries had similar protectionist major, measures like the Buy American Act, but in their countries. And they were in place to also protect their tax dollars or their public funds. And so what happened during the 1970s was countries began entering into these international trade negotiations and they would often require that governments participating in these negotiations or these trade agreements um, to treat certain products and services in a certain way. And they wanted to give them a preference, kind of eliminate these Buy American Act type uh, preferences that were existing. And during the 70s, the U.S. joined multiple free trade agreements. The most important of one for this purpose or for our conversation today is the WTO or the World Trade Organization's government procurement agreement. So in 1979, Congress passed the Trade Agreements Act of 1979 um, to really help adopt our obligations under the World Trade Organization uh, government procurement agreement. And in doing so, that law authorizes the president to waive domestic preference laws like the Buy American Act. However, it also requires the president to prohibit procurement of products from countries that aren't designated under the act. And the reason uh, this prohibition is there is to encourage countries to become part of free trade agreements. It helps to, it's, it's kind of a, a carrot system in a carrot and stick world. This is, we dangle this carrot, um, which is preference or good treatment in these free trade agreements as a way to get you to join them. <laughs> 
And so because of that, the law very much limits the government's authority to waive the Trade Agreements Act. Um, it's limited to agency heads, and they can only waive the Trade Agreements Act on a case-by-case -case basis, and it has to be in the national interest. So as you can see, it's a very high bar to waive the Trade Agreements Act. And that waiver authority is even then subject to interagency review. So this is a very difficult bar to pass, um, in part because of our obligations under our Trade Agreements Act, um, or I'm sorry, our Trade Agreements. And just as a footnote there, it's not really something that's going to come up for most of you, but there is additional authority by the Secretary of Defense to waive uh, the Trade Agreements Act, but once again, it's going to be a pretty high bar there. And if, if I may, Jane, and this is one area in, for those folks who do a whole lot of government contracts on the phone today, uh, that it's an area where most of the times if you have a contractual issue, a contractual matter for interpretation, you go to the contracting officer. And the contracting officer has authority up to his or her warrant, the ability to, to authorize the government to expend funds under that contract to issue you a, a decision or an answer of, of, of what that issue may be. Here, it's really important to, 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 for us to emphasize because, you know, we, we have it on the slide here, but just keep in mind that if, if you as a contractor are seeking a waiver of the Trade Agreements Act, it's not the contracting officer who has the authority or the ability to do that. It's, as Jana mentioned, it's the head of the agency here, uh, and, and that is a significant change from, you know, probably 90% or so of the contract administration functions that the contracting officer has. This has to be done by the agency head, which is a fairly significant uh, step in undertaking. And so just to kind of round out what we've been talking about for uh, those of you who like a, a quick summary at the end of these, the Buy American Act is a preference for U.S. products. The Trade Agreements Act is um, a sister act to the Buy American Act, but it really is also a waiver of it. It's a waiver of the Buy American Act and a prohibition on acquiring supplies or services from non-designated countries. And we require, or the government, I should say, requires following the Trade Agreements Act so that we can incentivize countries to enter into free trade agreements with us as a country. And the agency's ability to not follow the Trade Agreements Act is very limited, and it's limited to specific people, and it's limited to specific circumstances. Now, we're going to talk about how the Trade Agreements Act is applied to contracts. We know what it is. We know um, the history of it. So how is it really applied to a contract? For those of you who are more familiar with procurement, this is going to be a pretty easy question for you. It's the FAR, or as we, um, that's how we call it, I should say, but it's also known as the Federal Acquisition Regulation. And it's going to be implemented in our contracts in a couple different ways. But mainly, um, we're going to look at FAR Part 25, which places requirements on the agency and the contracting officer. And this was the uh, FAR part that Jeff mentioned earlier. And then there's going to be the FAR clause that we'll have to look at, FAR 52.225. And that's going to place requirements on the agency and the contracting officer as well as the contractor. And that's going to be mostly where the uh, contractor's obligations are going to flow from. So that's where most of our conversation is going to focus today. Uh, we will point out, though, that there are FAR supplement parts and clauses that also address all the various parts of the FAR, but in particular here, the trade agreements. And Due to time constraints, we're not going to address all of the supplements and clauses, but that is something you all need to be aware of for those of you with contracts uh, with various agencies is to double check and make sure that the clause in your contract is either the FAR clause or to see if it is a uh, supplement-specific clause as well. And this is an area where we will talk about a little bit further, but I think it's important to mention and set the stage that oftentimes uh, clients and companies come to us on a, on a fairly regular basis, unfortunately, and they'll say, well, we have a Trade Agreements Act a problem, uh, and we'll say, well, what clauses in the contract, what regulations apply, and they say, we don't know, um, and so, the, the, you know, because they've never read their contract before. So it's very important that you, preferably before you sign your contract, uh, you read the contract to understand not only what the Trade Agreements Act and other requirements, and, and uh, the Trade Agreements Act is, 
but also the other requirements of the contract. But since we're talking about Trade Agreements Act today, understanding that you have the right clauses uh, and, and right obligations in the contract is essential to avoid uh, future problems down the road. All right. So within FAR Part 25, the area that really focuses on trade agreements is FAR 25.4. And we'll walk through a couple of those smaller provisions just so you have an idea of really what the agencies have to consider so that you all know what you need to be doing when you're dealing with the agency and the contracting officer. Um, or even if you're a subcontractor and dealing with a prime contractor, what, what kinds of things are going on behind the scenes there. So FAR 25400 um, really explains that various trade agreements apply to the various acquisitions. Um, I won't go through the whole list there. It's a list you're going to see multiple times throughout, but those are essentially our designated countries that we're going to be talking about throughout today, except the Israeli Trade Act and the Agreement on Trade and, on trade and Civil Aircraft. That's going to be slightly different, but there are going to be other provisions that are going to be noted under FAR 25.4. Um, but once again, we're really focusing on the Trade Agreements Act there. And FAR 25401 lists out some exceptions and exclusions to the trade agreements requirements. And that's another area where it's really particular to specific contracts, so we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty there. But that is something you all may want to look at if you're trying to talk with the contracting officer and they're telling you that there's an exception here. Um, that would be the area you would want to look at because that's where agencies are going to look. And uh, for those of you who are looking at the slide, um, you'll notice, I think, purposefully, uh, one country that's missing there. Um, and that country is China. Uh, China uh, is, is not part of the uh, government procurement agreement, uh, so therefore they can't take advantage of the uh, uh, international trade agreements and, and, and preference of the and, and, and uh, uh, provisions of the Trade Agreements Act. Uh, China is the country that causes most problems. Uh, in this area uh, for U.S. government contractors. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, there was a trade agreement that case that was uh, uh, bought by a key TAM relator, a, 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 a company in Texas bought a case because against Office Max and, and Staples and those type of uh, big box office supply stores. Uh, it turns out that this, uh, those companies were getting pencils from China. Uh, no damages to the U.S. government government was paying for those, it was getting a, a very good price on those pencils, but they were made in China. Those pencils made in China violated the Trade Agreements Act, and those companies paid in the range of 10 to $15 million each for violating the Trade Agreements Act under their GSA schedule contracts. So we're talking real money, real liability here, uh, and, and when you, if you are sourcing supplies or end products from China, uh, this is an area, and you're providing them to the U.S. government, uh, either directly or through a higher tier contractor. This is an area where you really should be focusing on. All right, and speaking of money, that is one of the considerations that the agency and contracting officer have to look at when they're trying to figure out whether or not to apply uh, various trade agreements clauses to your contract, or to the contract, I should say. And so what's going to happen is they're going to look at FAR 25402, which lists out dollar thresholds for applicability to the contract. And they're going to determine this based on the value of the acquisition. And that value is going to change uh, over the years. Generally, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office can change it every two years. And from what we've seen, that's what they tend to do. And it can go up. It can go down. It's not necessarily a straight line up, um, which is what some people may expect. It really does vary over the time periods. Um, and just as a question – or as a – preempting any questions that you all might have, uh, the GSA applies this to the schedule contract level. And so it applies regardless of the dollar value um, under GSA schedules. So just if you have a question as to whether or not it's going to apply um, for something where you're not exactly sure what the contract is going to be, it's not necessarily a firm fixed price going in, um, there, there is definitely the chance that it's going to apply given the uh, estimate of the dollar value or how the agency is determined to treat it in advance. And so this slide, it, it might be a little hard for you all to read at home, but essentially what it does is it sets out the current thresholds for application of the various 
uh, trade agreements. And the one in red there is really the one that you're going to focus on, mostly because that's what triggers the trade agreements clause. The dollar value there of 191,000 for supply contracts or service contracts, or about 7.4 million on construction contracts. You'll see most of the other trade agreements have similar uh, dollar requirements, and there's going to be some that have a little bit less. And for any contracts that are valued in that kind of area below 191 um, for supplier services, there might be different uh, clauses applied to your contract. So you may not necessarily have the trade agreements clause in your contract, but it's going to be a clause that addresses the other trade agreements that come into play there. Um, but the reason we have this here is just so you have an idea of what the current threshold is for most of the trade agreements, which then triggers the trade agreements clause. And then um, once the CO or the agency has determined that the trade agreements clause is going to um, apply because it's above the dollar threshold, they're going to look and see what provisions and contract clauses they need to include so they can uh, comply with the Trade Agreements Act on their side. And essentially, FAR 25.11 provides directions to the contracting officer on solicitation provisions and clauses they need to include or he needs or she needs to include. And you'll see there we've got a list of a few of those uh, provisions in FAR 25. And that's FAR 25-1101 addresses, addresses acquisition of supplies. FAR 25-1102 addresses acquisition of construction. And 25-1103 addresses other provisions and clauses. And the other provisions and clauses that it looks to are restrictions on certain foreign purchases, translations, and foreign currency office offers. And so as you look through that, you'll see there's probably something missing there given that we know uh, what the Trade Agreements Act applies to. So really what's missing? And hopefully you came to the same answer that we did here, <laughs> which is that there are no separate provisions and clauses specifically for services. Uh, services are generally going to be addressed by the agency and the valuation of offers and bids. And that's really the time period when the agency is looking at services. But that doesn't mean that services don't come into play at all. As FAR 25-1101 points out, in acquisition of supply contracts, um, the, the Trade Agreements Act clause on supplies is going to be inserted when there is going to be an acquisition of supplies and the acquisition of services involving the furnishing of supplies. So just because it's a service contract doesn't mean you're necessarily off the hook after the evaluation stage. It may mean that you also have to make sure you're providing supplies that comply uh, that may be a part of your contract as well. And as you can see, this uh, C1 is part of FAR 25-1101, and it directs the contracting officer to include the clause on supplies whenever um, or to include the clause, excuse me, whenever there are supplies provided to the government even as part of services. And we just point out there, you'll see the, the small bullet point notes that this might um, include acquisition through purchase or lease for supply contracts. So next we're going to ask ourselves, will the clause be added to the contract? Now this is a question that most of the time you're not going to have to answer but it's because it's generally the agency or the contracting officer's responsibility to answer this question, and they should uh, theoretically be answering this before they issue their solicitation and definitely before they award the contract. But why should you as a contractor or a subcontractor consider this? Uh, mostly so that you can anticipate when the clause is going to be added to a procurement. You also need to know this and ask yourself this question to prevent uh, making an incorrect assumption about whether or not the clause is in your contract or um, as a prime contractor or a subcontractor. And it, being able to answer this question will also help you to better speak with the government counterparts about the issue. And, and I think one important factor here, Jaina, um, is the uh, continued emphasis by the government on acquiring bundled services and supplies under a single contract. So as Jaina mentioned before, there's you know different contract uh, provisions, whether it's uh, uh, 
general supplies, construction materials, services, uh, a lot of times we're seeing a lot of services and supplies just all melded together in one contract. And, you know, in the acquisition planning stage, Jana is entirely correct. It's really not the contractor's obligation to figure out which clauses have to be in the, in the solicitation. Those should be provided to you by the contracting officer. But sometimes they're not, and sometimes you'll have both a Trade Agreements Act and a Buy America um, uh, clauses in the contract. And really, as I said, the two are, you know, inconsistent with one another and should be, should be clarified at the solicitation phase, if at all possible, to avoid ambiguity not only in the contract formation stage, but also in the, uh, later on in the administration of the contract by the, by the government and the contractor. All right. So here we're going to have three separate scenarios. They should be pretty quick, but it gives you a chance to consider whether or not a clause should be added to the contract. So the first is a situation, and we'd love to have you guys uh, just do a quick response in your chat box there, letting us know how, whether or not you think the uh, trade agreements clause is going to be added to the contract, given what we've talked about so far. So if an RFP has been issued for automobile repair services that the government estimates will cost about $150,000 over the three-year contract, is that a solicitation where the government will be or should be adding in the trade agreements clause? So we'll give you guys about five seconds. Think about this and let us know what you think. All right. So for this one, the answer is no, and it's because it's under the threshold for the trade agreements clause. So uh, it's under the $191,000 threshold. So no, it will not be added to this contract. And since everyone's paying attention, we had a 95% success rate on that response. <laughs> and... Our next scenario, there's an RFP for an on-site computer repair services, uh, or for on-site computer repair services that the government estimates will cost about $500,000 over the one-year contract. Is this a situation in which the trade agreements clause will be added? We'll give you guys a couple seconds to answer this one. All right, so for this one, it is yes. And it's because it's a services contract and it is more than the threshold. And we're getting better. We're at 97% on that one. So thank you. Keep up the good work. And for scenario three, this is an RFP for a firm fixed price contract for the contractor to provide furniture that the government will use and that will be returned to the contractor at the end of the contract. The government estimates that the value of this contract is about $1.2 million. Is this a contract in which the TAA clause will be added? And the answer to this one is yes, and it is because the acquisition of supplies is more, and it is for the acquisition of supplies, and it is more than the threshold. So now that we've gone through what the Trade Agreements Act, uh, or I'm sorry, whether the Trade Agreements Act will be applied, are a few takeaways for those at home are that the TAA clause will apply if the value of the acquisition is more than 191,000, which is the current threshold. It will apply to contracts where the contract is for services, for supplies, for services and supplies, or for construction contracts. And it will apply if the supplies are acquired by the government through purchase or lease. And, and uh, as far as that last bullet point is concerned, you know, purchase or lease, the last two bullet points, with respect to leasing of uh, supplies or services, for that matter, um, uh, you know, transferring of title is not dispositive in terms of assessing whether or not the Trade Agreement Act applies. If there's a lease, um, in the general sense, uh, the Trade Agreements Act does apply to leases, and contractors need to make sure they comply with those obligations, even though they may be getting the uh, end products back at the end of performance. All right. Now we finally get to the actual TAA clause. And what we've got here on this slide is an abbreviated version of it. We did not include all of the definitions, but the definitions are in Section A of this clause. But what we focused on here on, on this slide is really the uh, obligation on the contractor. And I'm going to read this to you only because we're going to break down a lot of what this means over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. And it will be important for us to kind of have the same language to start from, so some of these words, it'll be good just to get in our minds as we move on. So the clause requires 
um, the delivery of end products. And it says, the contracting officer has determined that the WTO, GPA, and FTAs apply to this acquisition. Unless otherwise specified, these trade agreements apply to all items in the schedule. The contractor shall deliver under this contract only U.S. made or designated country end products, except to the extent that, in its offer, it specified delivery of other end products in the provision entitled Trade Agreement Certificate. All right. So now we know what the clause is, and we're going to really break down, like I said, the requirements of it. And so the first thing to think about is what do you have to provide? What does that clause require you to provide? And it's essentially, it requires provision of only U.S.-made or designated country end products. So we'll get to the U.S.-made or designated country part in a moment, but right now we're going to focus on end products and what are they. As the TAA clause uh, say, states they are the articles, materials, and supplies to be acquired under the contract for public use. Now, that definition is a little bit different, or maybe more than a little bit different, than another definition found in the FAR. FAR 2.101, which is where a lot of definitions are, states that an end product is a line item of a government contract. So for those who are um, looking at their contracts and trying to figure out exactly what an end product is, and they're trying to figure out which of these definition applies, the, the main takeaway that you can take from this is that an end product can be more or less than a line item. It's not necessarily a line item. And there's case law that supports this interpretation as well. So we know <laughs> that it's not just an, a line item, but that still doesn't tell us exactly what an end product is. So we'll, we'll dig a little bit more into that. So what it, it is depends on what the government is buying. And generally, that's going to be um, looking at what is being acquired for public use. And that uh, clause there, public use, is what's in the uh, FAR clause itself. And so who determines what is being acquired for public use, or more particularly, what an end product actually is? And generally, that's going to be a government determination again. That's going to be something that the government needs to determine before uh, issuing the solicitation or during the solicitation phase. And the government should be stating what those end products are during the solicitation. And we've seen sometimes uh, protests for uh, contractors challenging the government's determination of what an end product is. and. Generally, any reviewing agency or court, and by agency we mean the Government Accountability Office or even an agency itself reviewing its own uh, uh, solicitations, they're going to give the government's interpretation deference there. So that's something to keep in mind for folks who are looking at this at the solicitation phase. But that is generally a uh, government determination and it gets discretion. But the government's not always going to make that determination, we've seen. And sometimes there's going to be uh, situations where the government doesn't make that determination before award, and the parties don't come to an agreement on the uh, determination of what end products are prior to award. And if that happens, it's generally going to be an issue of contract interpretation of what an end product is. And hopefully you can start to see that might cause problems down the road for folks. And, and I can assure you that it's far less costly to come to an answer on what is an end product before award than it will be after award. As Jada mentioned, you know, pre-award is the time to clarify any ambiguities in the contract, and we're not suggesting you have to go out and protest every ambiguity uh, you know, that you feel is in the contract. You could have a discussion with the contracting officer through the Q&A period. You could raise this uh, with the CO. Uh, if there's no Q&A period, you could simply just raise this with the CO, and that is which contract clause applies, uh, you know, is it by America Trade Agreements, and then to end products, so, you know, what is it exactly that the government is acquiring under this contract? In a, in a few moments, we'll have a couple different scenarios to outline to you again to, to see what you, what you all are thinking in terms of what is an end product. but. Doing that certainly before the award is makes much more fiscal sense than doing it after award because generally speaking, if it happens after award, it doesn't happen, you know, the day after award and you say, oh, we don't know what we're giving to the government. This will happen six months, a year, two years, three years into the contract performance uh, 
sometimes the people who negotiated the contract for the company are no longer there. And now you're stuck with the situation of not only not understanding what's in the contract between the government and the contractor, but also the contractor doesn't have the historical knowledge because either the people are gone or they forgot or they were asleep that day at their desk as to what is the item that's being uh, procured under the contract. So once again, if you have the opportunity, uh, or you should make yourself, if at all possible, the opportunity to make that determination pre-award. All right, so we're going to have a few more scenarios here, and this is, I think, our last set of scenarios, but this is really to help you guys think about what an end product is under a contract. And so under the first scenario, the government and the contractor have a contract for the government to lease a large industrial refrigerator. Are the handles, shelves, or light bulb in the unit end products? So take a second and think whether or not those are the end products here. And generally, I think the answer should be no. The government is using the refrigerator here, and so that's what's being acquired for public use, and that's most likely what the government would determine the end product is. And so let's look at scenario number two, though. The government and the contractor have an agreement for the government to purchase spare parts for a large industrial refrigerator. For this refrigerator, um, it will, again, have handles, shelves, and light bulbs, but they're being purchased as spare parts, and are those end products in this situation? And I would say most likely in this situation, the government would determine that they are end products because those are the items that the government is acquiring for public use. And then our final scenario here is the government and the contractor have an agreement for the government to purchase a large industrial refrigerator, but this time they're purchasing also maintenance services. And those services include replacement of handles, shelves, or light bulbs if any of those become worn out during the life of the contract. In this situation are the handles, shelves, or light bulbs and products. And, and I think this is a situation where we definitely would have hoped the government stated this up front because for, um, you know, when you compare where this falls in between scenario one and two, it's somewhere in between. And where the government comes out may end up being different um, in different situations or it may be different based on what the rest of the contract says. And, and, and once again, that gets back to not only, as we just said, trying to negotiate this or, or determine this pre-award, but also to read your solicitation at the time you get the solicitation, not you know six months after award. Uh, it really does, it really does help to clarify any potential am ambiguity. I just say one other point about the scenarios that we just provided to you, and we're not looking, we're, we're looking here just to give you a sense how, in this case, we had three different scenarios, and you really you know potentially had on the first two com different answers. The first one was no, the second one was yes. The third scenario uh, is, 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 is likely yes, but certainly we could make an argument that no, uh, it, it, they would not be end products under the contract. So that's really a question of contract interpretation, and, and if we could sort of uh, define that before an award, that would be preferable. But one of the reasons uh, uh, we, we one of the reasons we, we put these out here was just to sort of give you a sense of you know, the, the, the different answers depending on the specific facts of a, of a different contract situation. But one thing that I did want to point out, and Jane and I have had some experience with, is you don't want to get cute in making your own internal assessments. And by that I mean there have been, you know, a number of cases, uh, primarily with GSA, where contractors have provided items under their GSA schedule contract, uh, and they've tried to sort of essentially bundle them into a, a, a new product or a new kit uh, that would sort of get themselves out under the Trade Agreements Act uh, provisions. Uh, uh, for example, um, uh, some tool manufacturers had a bunch of tools that they were providing to the U.S. government, and they would provide those tools similar to example number two, where they would do, you know, a wrench, a screwdriver, a hammer, what have you. And sometimes they'd package them together, other times they were available individually. Well, this contractor started wanting to make all these tools in China, uh, and they were told that, well, that would be a problem because of the Trade Agreements Act. Well, what then sort of transpired was they made these tools, they went ahead and made these tools in China, the wrench, the screwdriver, and the hammer, but they came up with a tool kit, a box, that was made here in the United States uh, that would satisfy the Trade Agreements Act. And they put all the tools, the hammer, the screwdriver, and the wrench, and others, in the, in the toolbox made in the United States, 
and what they sold was a tool kit. And they said the tool, tool kit was the end product, the actual box itself with all the tools in it. Well, we certainly recognize that in a situation there is bundling uh, of, 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 of a mouse, a keyboard, uh, a hard drive, and that sometimes makes a computer system. But in this case, with a tool kit, I think the G uh, government said that the contractor was, was trying to be too cute uh, with trying to skate around the requirements of the Trade Agreements Act, in particular manufacturing individual tools in China, that the tools themselves, throwing them in a box, a tool kit, or a, uh, a, a, a waistband with uh, tool slots would not suffice to satisfy the Trade Agreements Act. So once again, certainly make your determination, make your assessment, have the conversations that you may need to have with the, the contracting um, personnel, but uh, when you make your assessments, you know, be intellectually honest, and, and, and I, I don't think anyone on the phone uh, would do this, but these are just some of the things that we've seen out in the marketplace where some contractors try to sort of try to get up and, and around some of these regulations. And to that same point, and also as to why uh, these, these examples or these scenarios seemed a little bit uh, repetitive, we also wanted to point out that the end products... Um, can change what an end product is uh, may change depending on the contract. So something that's an end product under one contract may not necessarily be an end product under another contract. And that really does get to Jeff's earlier point as to it can be an issue of contract interpretation. And so just because you have something that's an end product under one contract doesn't necessarily mean for you it's going to be an end product under a different contract. All right. So now we know what needs to comply, and those are the end products. So now we have to look at whether or not those items actually do comply with the Trade Agreements Act clause. And to do that, we're going to have to look at the origins of that product or that end product. And we'll have to look at where it's from. And we'll look at some other aspects of the product as well. But essentially, the where gets us to the fact that the contractor has to deliver under the contract only U.S. made or designated country end products. So what makes an end product U.S. made or designated country? Uh, the U.S. is pretty easy. It's the 50 states, the District of Columbia, and outlying areas. So that includes places like Puerto Rico, for instance. Uh, then designated countries are the list there, the four um, types of countries that are listed there. The World Trade Organization, GPA countries, free trade agreement countries, least developed countries, um, which are countries that are not necessarily under a trade agreement but are otherwise designated, and then Caribbean Basin countries as well. And, and, and for those of you who have a FAR on your – the Federal Acquisition Regulation book on your desk or the CFR with – you know, 48 CFR with the, the reprint of the FAR uh, in, in the actual CFR volume uh, on your desk uh, – Section uh, or Part 25, as I mentioned before, 25.4, um, has all these definitions of what these countries are uh, and, and what countries fall under the WTO GPA country, free trade country, uh, least developed country, Caribbean Basin country, and you'll sort of see the listing of countries that are under each one of these categories. So certainly worthwhile if you're operating in this, in this uh, industry and space, take a look at those countries, see where things can be made that sort of set, qualify as trade agreements, what I call trade agreements at countries, better stated as Jana put up on the board, a designated country, uh, and, and sort of make sure your, your products are there. And you will notice once again that China is uh, noticeably absent. And to Jeff's point, I think a lot of folks think of China as being – one of the big countries that is missing from this, and that's because they're a large manufacturing company, or I'm sorry, country, but there are multiple other countries that are missing as well. So we've put together a map that shows um, essentially the countries as listed or not list or not listed under the free, um, I'm sorry, under FAR 25, uh, the, I'm sorry, the clause. <laughs> and here you'll see on our map, the blue countries are the United States. Um, I should say the blue country is the United States. And on this map, green means go. There's a number of different shades of green, and those represent the different types of uh, designated countries. But the red countries are the no countries. Those are the ones that are not a designated country, or at least under the 2016 version of the clause. And I think as you look at that map, um, I was surprised after our graphics people put this together for us at just how many countries are missing um, or that are in red here. 
how many countries are not designated. And some of them were a surprise to me. Uh, for instance, Brazil, I kind of thought that might be on there. I, I kind of thought South Africa may be a designated country. So the reason we have this map here is not um, for you to use it for compliance purposes. We don't want you to look at this map to determine whether or not an item is uh, compliant or not. You have to look at your contract and see what contract clause is in it and what countries are listed there to make that determination. But this map is really just intended to show you how many countries are not designated and to show you that there are a vast number of countries that are not within the trade agreements clause and so that you do need to be vigilant and um, mindful as to where your items are coming from. So how do you make that determination? How do you know where something is made? How do you know whether or not it is from one of those green countries, uh, a designated country, or the United States, or whether it's from a non-designated country? In general, that's going to happen um, based on where the product was mined, grown, produced, or manufactured. And um, that's generally going to be a substantially transformed analysis. Uh, we note at the bottom that the Caribbean Basin Initiative countries also have some certain exclusions that come into play here. We're not going to talk about those because, as you can see, we included the list there. Those exclusions are um, rather limited and probably inapplicable to the folks uh, dialing in today, but we just wanted you to note that in case it does come up for you all. But in general, we're going to focus on the substantially transformed question because that tends to be the question that contractors get um, tangled up in during their contract performance. So the, the reason um, contractors can get tangled up in this is because products are often made up of multiple components or parts and those components or parts often come from multiple countries these days. And because of that, the uh, manufacturer will need to do a substantial transformation analysis to determine what country the end product is from. And a substantial transformation analysis is going to consider whether an article has been substantially transformed into a new and different article of commerce with a name, character, or use distinct from the original article. And we note at the bottom before we move on that a determination on whether or not a substantial transformation has occurred does not change what an end product is. An end product is a determination that happens um, across the contract and just because something has been substantially transformed does not make it an end product. Think about the light bulb in those scenarios we just had and whether or not the light bulb had been substantially transformed doesn't affect whether or not it's an end product. It's how whether or not the government is acquiring it for public use. And so that's something we see folks get tripped up on in the um, contracting world. And so we just wanted to point that out before we really dig into the substantial transformation analysis um, overview more. And, and we will break out uh, the substantial transformation uh, discussion a little bit further. But, you know, one thing that, you know, folks often ask us is, well, we have all these parts, in, and as Jana mentioned, and they're made in China or made in other non-designated you know, non countries, uh, but we bring them to the United States or we bring them to uh, you know, Germany or, or somewhere in the United Kingdom, and we assemble them there. Well, that depends. That depends on what the assembly is. You know what constitutes the assembly. Um, you know the general rule is that mere assembly does not constitute trans substantial transformation. So, just you know, putting the parts together uh, in the United States or a designated country in and of itself does not constitute substantial transformation. It has to be something more. But we're going to talk about that. But I thought I'd mention that now in terms of as you think about the next couple slides of substantial transformation, it's just more than sort of opening up a box, taking out 25 parts, and screwing them together, and there you have an end product. Doesn't it, it's, I wish it was, but it's not that easy. <laughs> All right. Now, despite the fact that our header up here says how, it'll take us just a few more seconds to actually get to the how, because first, uh, what's important is to figure out who's making this determination on the origins of um, an end product, and who might the contractor rely on to make this determination. And I say the contractor rely on because generally the contractor is going to be the party responsible for making this determination of whether an end product is from a Trade Agreement Act compliant country. And the contractor can rely on the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And 
those decisions, um, the decisions of the Customs and Border Protection, um, may be relied on by the contractor, be, and those are given exceptional weight if they have to be reviewed by the procurement folks. However, those are expensive. Going to CBP can be costly for contractors, uh, in part because they generally will rely on outside counsel to help them draft the narrative and the information that goes to CBP. So contractors may try to take a different route to come up with an answer of whether or not substantial transformation has occurred. And they might rely on a third-party expert or they may rely on an in-house expert, somebody in-house at their um, company, or they may rely on the agency um, through conversations. Nevertheless, as we've pointed out here, the, the one that can be given exceptional weight and the one that's going to be treated um, with most deference is going to be the CBP determination. And what are these folks going to look at? How are they going to make this determination? They're essentially going to look at tariff laws when making that determination. And as has been pointed out by a court previously, that, that question is really a mixed question of technology and customs law, mostly the latter, which, as you can see, is why U.S. Customs and Border Protection is the agency that we want to rely on then for this determination. So then what does this mean for you as a contractor? Well, for manufacturers, that answer is going to be different than for people, or I'm sorry, for contractors who are not manufacturing goods themselves. For manufacturers, that's going to mean that you will need to determine whether your end products are TAA compliant. If you have a co contract with the government that has the trade agreements clause, you're going to have to make that determination of whether or not the products are compliant. And you'll need to do a substantial transformation analysis, most likely. So what are you going to have to consider or what will CBP consider? It's going to be a very holistic look. It's going to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis and look at the totality of the circumstances, really look at the circum uh, I'm sorry, the situation. And you, it's going to include multiple considerations with no factor being determinative. It will consider the country of origin of the components, um, it will look at the extent of processing that occurs within a given country. It will look at the resources that the company expends on product design and development here. Um, it will also look at the nature and the extent of post-assembly inspection. And it will also look at the worker skill that's required during the, the actual manufacturing process. And, and as we pointed out earlier, or as I pointed out earlier, I should say, no one factor is determinative it's going to be a holistic consideration. Um, but then, as may be difficult for manufacturers, is maintaining compliance throughout contract performance. Uh, supply chains are going to change, change over, especially if you have a five-year contract, you may have supply chains that change, and that's gonna be one of the difficulties you'll face. And one of the things that Jane and I would first request from a company or a client, you know, looking to sort of make this determination and our assistance in helping make this determination is the bill of materials. So whatever the product is, we want to see the, the component parts, the cost of the component parts, uh, and everything in between. And, and just like mere assembly does not constitute transformation, as, as Jana mentioned, no one such factor is determinative, the same thing with, with cost. Uh, the, 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 the financials or the cost of each of the parts in and of itself is not determinative either. So as an example, if, you know, 90% uh, of the uh, work is done in a designated country, but 10% is done in China uh, based on a cost perspective, if the product is the product in China and it's essentially exported to a designated country to do the remaining 90%, that 90% in and of itself may not constitute substantial transformation either. But these are, as, as sort of the, the first bullet says, uh, these are really case-by-case -case situations. There's no one-size-fits-all. And if you were to ever pick up a, a, the opinions from the Customs and Border Protection on software, as an example, uh, you'll see a... Uh, a developing trend of patterns of what you know constitutes substantial transformation of software, 
or information technology, but there's still differences that really requires careful scrutiny. So this is not a simple uh, calculus that is made, but one that takes time and, and, and a lot of information is generally needed. Now, for co companies that are not manufacturers, but that may nevertheless have the trade agreements clause in their contract, they often will question whether or not they have liability to the government or if they have some safe harbor to um, when providing their suppliers or subcontractors uh, in products to the government. And the answer to the question about whether or not there's a safe harbor is no, because prime contractors may have liability to the government if the contractor knowingly furnished non-compliant end products to the government. And this gets to the, the False Claims Act discussion that Jeff mentioned at the very beginning, um, but knowingly under the False Claims Act is going to include more than just actual knowledge. It might include a disregard of the truth or not caring whether or not you have properly certified to your subcontractor's uh, compliance. So how do prime contractors avoid this liability? If the prime contractor reasonably relied on subcontractor certification um, that the information regarding the country of origin is accurate and complies with the Trade Agreements Act, the prime contractor generally can avoid liability. And that's based on a D.C. Circuit case from a couple of years ago. If you are certifying the compliance for uh, your subcontractors um, uh, and products, one thing to can make sure you have just as a prophylactic measure is an indemnification clause in your agreement with your subcontractor. So in your subcontract agreement, that sort of covers the liability if, in fact, a Trade Agreements Act difficulty or liability arises, uh, whether it's a standalone Trade Agreements Act indemnification provision or one that encompasses, you know, unique government contract terms and conditions, what have you. But that is a good measure to make sure that is in your – a good provision to make sure is in your subcontracts agreement that the subcontract will indemnify you as the prime if they are – if they give rise to False Claims Act or other liability under the government contract. All right. So we finished up uh, discussing what the clause requires of contractors and some takeaways for you to um, help – kind of condense what we've talked about there because it is a very heavy topic. Um, so hopefully this will help kind of uh, reaffirm some of the things we just talked about for you. But the takeaways for you are whether something is an end product and must comply with the Trade Agreements Act clause depends on what the government is going to be using under this contract. And it's going to be imperative for contractors to get that from the government, um, to get that uh, interpretation from the government before the award. And whether or not an end product is from the U.S. or a designated country depends on where it was mined, grown, produced, or manufactured, or where it was substantially transformed. And uh, finally, manufacturers will need to do a substantial transformation analysis, and non-manufacturers will need to obtain subcontractors and suppliers certifications regarding the country of origin and make sure that that information is accurate and that the item complies with the Trade Agreements Act. Now, finally, we're going to get to some best practices. We've talked about uh, what the Trade Agreements Act is, when it's applied to contracts, and what it requires. And these next four slides are really going to outline some best practices. There are some of these Jeff and I have discussed, uh, sprinkled out throughout the rest of this presentation. And I know it might seem painful to have gone through 30-some-odd slides before this to get to why you probably signed up for this in the first place. but um, we, we think it's really important to actually get to uh, or to understand the background of the clause before we can explain what helps you comply. And we're going to start from the beginning um, of the contract cycle here so that you can really start to think about putting compliance procedures in place from the very beginning of the contract cycle for your team as well. And that all starts with building a potential contract team for your company. And when you know a solicitation is coming down the pipeline, you want to ensure that all of the employees that might work on the contract are trained in TAA compliance or that they will be able to be trained prior to contract commencement. When there is going to be a tight turnaround between award and uh, performance um, commencing, 
that's going to limit the amount of time you have to get a TAA training in place for some of your employees who are not familiar with it. So it's going to be important for you all to figure that timeline in when you're establishing your team. And I would also add that if you are sourcing any products uh, from, and I won't use the term end products because I want at least the red flag to, to, to be uh, 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 hoisted up the flagpole, if you are sourcing any products from China and supplying the U.S. government, uh, as China is part of that uh, supply chain, I think you, it's essential that you have at least an understanding of the Trade Agreements Act and whether and how that applies to your company delivery of those products to the U.S. government. Otherwise, I think you're just playing with fire. And um, when you're looking at the contracts team and, you know, your, your own supply chain, um, one of the things that you also need to be looking at is your proposal team, though, and your sales team. Um, and they need to be familiar with the trade agreements clause and the potential um, issues that can arise if they help you put together a proposal that doesn't have trade agreement um, compliant products or versions of those products in the proposal. And this is something that we see more of an issue um, with the bigger companies, actually more so than the smaller companies. And that tends to be because some of the bigger companies out there will have completely separate sales or proposal teams, and they may not be quite as familiar with some of the um, various parts of the government solicitation process and may tend to overlook some of those clauses incorporated by reference and not really take into account the fact that some of those clauses incorporated by reference actually do impact the price and do impact the actual items um, that can be offered to the government. And so it's going to be important that if you have a sales or proposal team that's working sort of siloed from the rest of your team, that they really do understand what this means. And that gets us to the next step, which is really making the offer. And how can a contractor make sure they're following best practices when they make the offer? One of the first things they need to do, of course, is determine whether or not the Trade Agreements Act applies to the solicitation or to the contract. And once they make that determination and that it is part of the contract or solicitation, uh, then they need to determine what the end products are under that uh, solicitation and contract. And sometimes it's very easy. We have seen uh, solicitations that state in black letter, you know, language, the end products under this are X, Y, Z. And in that situation, it's very clear what the end products are. However, there are, are other solicitations where it is not so well defined. And in those instances, a best practice for contractors is um, trying to make this determination on your end before the Q&A period and then confirming it with the government through the Q&A process. And as you all know, if you miss the deadline to ask questions, Sometimes you might be out of luck in getting that answer. So it's really imperative that your folks know to look for this early on in the solicitation process. And after all of that has been determined and the end products are known under the um, solicitation, the contractors need to analyze what product lines they have and make sure that they're offering only TAA compliant end products. And then make sure that that bid or offer reflects that. And if necessary, complete a trade agreement certificate. And that's something we haven't talked about uh, significantly in this presentation. We've mentioned it briefly in a couple of um, uh, asides during some of our slides, but that certificate is essentially a statement that a product that you are, an end product that you are offering is not TAA compliant, and that will allow the government to make a decision upfront on how to treat that. And then finally, as far as preparing a bid or offer that will lead to compliance, as Jeff mentioned earlier, sometimes um, there's bundling. Sometimes it's not allowed by the government, um, but sometimes it is. And if it is allowed, as a contractor making an offer, you need to make sure that you're doing that and that you're doing it in the way that the government will uh, not find so cute in his terms. <laughs> <laughs> And once we've got the contract in place, or I'm sorry, once the offer has been made and the contract will be getting into place, um, before the contractor enters into the contract, one of the best practices you all can do is upon award, check the contract clauses and make sure that the contract document 
is consistent with your understanding before it is signed. Um, and that's something you probably already do under for most of the provisions there, but make sure that that also happens for the trade agreements clause, not just the statement of work, um, but make sure that everything that you thought um, was supposed to be in there is actually in there and that the government and make sure that the government hasn't changed anything in between. Um, you also need to make sure that if, for instance, um, you were in a situation where end products were not addressed during the solicitation phase, where they weren't stated during the, uh, or I'm sorry, in the solicitation, and you and the government didn't come to an understanding as to what the end products were, make sure to do that now and get it in writing. And as Jeff said, you lose the institutional knowledge over the years of a contract. As um, some of the bigger contractors no, you may have somebody working for you for only a couple of years before they roll off onto another project, before they go off to another um, position, and having those things in writing will definitely help um, you prove later whether or not you came to that agreement with the government. And then you also need to notify all of your applicable personnel about the TAA clause being in the contract. And sometimes people will make sure that their contract folks know of this, but this is something that really needs to be brought to the attention of the subcontracts program and your compliance team members um, because they really are going to see different parts of the contracting process and they can help you ensure compliance throughout. And all of this needs to be done before you provide any goods to the government. And for many of you on the phone, and there's a number of large uh, institutions on, on, on this webinar, so we, we appreciate your participation and attendance. Uh, but as you know, you have multiple, as we said at the outset of this uh, discussion here, you have multiple departments, uh, multiple uh, uh, organizational elements, uh, and you would not believe how many times that we look at these issues on with companies, and as Jada mentioned, the sales and the you know, compliance people are aware of the obligations, but the program personnel are not, uh, or some senior executives are not. And that really sort of opens a company up for the likelihood of potential noncompliance with the TAA. And, oh, sorry. I skipped ahead by accident. <laughs> um, I, one area that we wanted to address here, and it may seem a little odd to address it earlier before we talk about some of the other parts for best practices, but we wanted to mention it now, the modifying the contract, in part because it is, uh, it does have some similarities to the early parts of the contract in many ways. And that's because during modification of a contract, oftentimes the contractor will propose some kind of change to the contract, whether or not the change comes from them originally or the government, but there's usually a little bit of a mini proposal um, negotiation phase that happens here. And when that happens during the contract performance, um, the contractor needs to ensure that only TAA compliant items are being proposed for contract modification. And, and so this is partly why you can see it's important to have both your contracts and program team um, on board and understanding the trade agreements clause because depending on how your company is set up, it may be your contracts team negotiating this, it may be your programs team um, negotiating this in part because of their discussions with the government agency. And, and, and if I could add one point, and I'm responsible for this modifying the contract section of, of this slide, so I apologize for what, what I'm about to say. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's oftentimes, sometimes the obvious is, is, is often overlooked, uh, and so it's, it certainly bears repeating, as we said earlier. You know, read the solicitation, know what clauses in the contract. I think probably 99% of you do that on a regular basis, uh, but it's for the 1% out there that, you know, frankly keeps Jada and I, you know, employed. Um, <laughs> co co compliance obligations, uh, you know, do not stop at the date of contract award. Uh, those, those contractual obligations continue throughout the contract, and whether a your company's supply chain uh, is is modified through the life of the contract, then it's incumbent upon you to address that internally, or whether the government comes to you and wants to modify the contract for whatever reason uh, and ask for, you know, supplies or services that you know are not TAA compliant, 
it's your obligation to address that not only internally but externally with the contracting officer uh, to make sure that he or she understands the difficulty in in uh, putting you in a position where you would not be complying with the TAA. Now, to avoid anyone sending a comment in, I will say this. You could address that with the contracting officer, and the contracting officer, he or she may sympathize with you. But at the end of the day, as we said before, the CEO has no authority to waive the TAA. You then would have to go back to uh, the head of the agency if you wanted to uh, provide noncompliant uh, items. And they would have to also determine that it was in the national security interest. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Um, which, which, which we may or may not have said, as you can imagine, is very difficult to uh, uh, obtain. So now we're going to get to actually providing those non-compliant, or I'm sorry, to providing those compliant <laughs> end products to the government. And, and what the best practices are going to be here are going to be different whether or not you are a manufacturer or a um, or a non-manufacturer. And we talked a little bit about these before, but essentially for manufacturers, you need to make sure to maintain information on your country of origin, I'm sorry, your component's country of origin, and all the other information that might be considered by CBP. So you need to make sure you keep that on the front end. And you also want to make sure that you're maintaining your supply chains and your manufacturing procedures if you've had a substantial transformation analysis uh, conducted. We say that, but as I said before, we also know that supply chains might need to change. For whatever reason, um, there may be security issues in various countries, or it just may be more um, financially um, beneficial to a company to change the supply chain of where you're manufacturing certain parts or where you're obtaining certain parts or components. And if that does happen, or you suspect it may happen in your um, company, you need to require pre-change notification coming to um, the person in charge of this substantial transformation analysis or um, monitoring it. And that person needs to be able to approve it before that change happens. And that's going to be important in maintaining compliance because once that change has happened and those products get into your supply chain and then are provided to the government, it's already an, uh, a violation there of your um, obligation to the government. And so that change notification really needs to happen beforehand because it's a lot, um, even though it's painful, it's going to be a lot easier to address before you change your supply chain than afterward and then have to figure out exactly how long the violations have occurred and how um, widespread they are. As for non-manufacturers, you need to make sure to require your suppliers to certify um, their country of origin if they are able to, and to certify that those, that country of origin um, is a country that complies with the Trade Agreements Act and to certify that that information is accurate. And you also want to make sure that all of your documentation reflects compliance with Trade Agreements Act. And I don't just mean reflects it and it isn't actually accurate, but that it reflects the accuracy there. You want to make sure that the request for proposals or your request for bids or offers or quotes mentions the Trade Agreements Act. You want to make sure that the proposals that you receive from your suppliers or subcontractors um, actually complies and that there aren't any exceptions noted in that. You also want to make sure that the actual purchase orders that are signed or the invoices that are signed don't have any exceptions noted um, because that might happen um, for a contractor. There may be a handwritten notation in there that says this set hasn't been um, acquired from a Trade Agreement Act compliant country and you want to be able to catch that through your own team. And as uh, I believe Jeff mentioned earlier, one of the other things you can do as a best practice if you're a non-manufacturer is to include an indemnif indemnification clause in subcontracts or sub supply agreements and that can help protect you. It's not going to be a, a perfect remedy by any means, but it is an additional uh, layer of protection and it's essentially a best practice, but not something that's going to be an ultimate protector for you in the end. And our final best practice slide is about monitoring compliance and it's really just to make sure that compliance is happening throughout. And it's something that 
government contractors are uh, doing all the time with their contracts, but this just helps set out a couple of different ways um, that are specific for manufacturers and non-manufacturers you can be thinking about, or a couple of different things, I'm sorry. And so for manufacturers, you want to make sure you're regularly reviewing your supply chains to confirm TAA compliance has been maintained. And we've said earlier, you know, you want to have that trigger that notifies your, um, perhaps your procurement team or your trade team or your contracts team about a change in the supply chain. But we know sometimes that might not necessarily happen. And that may ha not happen because of a breakdown in internal communications. It may not happen because of a breakdown in external communications. So it's something that should be regularly looked at for manufacturers. For non-manufacturers, um, you're going to want to regularly, regularly review your purchasing documents. And you're going to be reviewing those to confirm that only TAA compliant end products have been purchased or otherwise acquired. And you're not going to be able to determine that probably by looking at the products as much as the documents for your purposes, and that's why that's going to be more important for the non-manufacturers. And for all of the contractors, whether or not you're manufacturing or not, you want to make sure that you're investigating any suspect activities or omissions that come to your attention. Look at those early and look at those um, quickly. And the sooner you do that, the better it's going to be for you as far as complying. And if you do find that there has been a compliance issue, that's going to be a time when you need to consider if a disclosure is necessary. As Jeff pointed out at the very beginning, there are a number of companies that are disclosing this to the inspector generals. That means that the inspector generals have started to see this as a trend, and it may be um, something that could, could be an issue for the contractor if they um, do not disclose this, because this is something that we see other companies disclosing and that is becoming really an industry standard, I would say. And so this last slide, we're, we're almost out of time here. We won't spend time going over it. Um, it's not really the last slide, but almost the last slide. It really lists some practical issues for contractors to consider, whether or not you're a contractor, um, a prime contractor, or whether or not you're a subcontractor. And these are issues that we don't have a specific answer for every single com company. This is going to be different for every company, but these are things that you as a person or you as a company may need to think through and to figure out how you will address before it happens. These are just some things for you to discuss internally and for you kind of as a um, potential issues list to, to think about as you go forward and as you think about what you learned today. This might help you figure out how to issue spot things as well as how to deal with them when they do come up. And our final, I guess it is, two, two slides with some takeaways. They're things that we have gone through previously, but we put them here in our um, slide 38 and 39 really to help you guys have them in a central place. Um, so we won't go through those again because I, I don't want to hold you all over time, and I'm pretty proud of the fact that we finished <laughs> close to time, but I know Jeff has some things he wants to add. Uh, I, first of all, I appreciate everyone's participation, and as I said, we're about one minute over right now, but we received two questions uh, on the board, one of which Jane had just sort of answered on her own, and she probably didn't even realize that as she was reading the slide, and that is, um, where do you have to disclose a TAA violation uh, under the mandatory disclosure rule? Uh, the mandatory disclosure rule uh, came into effect a few years ago. It requires contractors to disclose certain violations of federal law and regulation. We won't go into that right now, uh, but to, if you have a TAA uh, violation that you know about, uh, or that you have credible evidence to suspect has occurred, you have an obligation to disclose it, as Jana mentioned, or as I mentioned as well in the beginning, to the Inspector General with a copy to your contracting officer as well. If you want more information on that, whoever asked a question or anyone else, by all means, uh, let us know our email contacts are at the end of the uh, program. But then the final question was, uh, how does the 50% rule apply to the TAA? Uh, and it's a great question because, uh, and that was asked early on in the program, and I hope by going through the uh, background of the Trade Agreements Act, we've already answered that question or the, the, the questioner has figured that out, and that is 
the 50% rule deals with the Buy American Act, and that, that rule says that 50% of the essentially deliverables under that government contract have to be manufactured in the United States as a designated country under the Buy American Act uh, construct. So um, the, the 50% rule is it's been come to known is really a Buy American Act uh, uh, approach or, or test, if you will, and the uh, substantial transformation is the cor- corresponding test under the Trade Agreements Act. We hope that helps and that answers that question as well. But we'd like to once again thank you all for taking part in our, our webinar on the Trade Agreements Act. Hopefully, we our goal at the outset was to help demystize some of these uh, regulations uh, and the statutory obligations that contractors have to face. What we what we see on a daily basis, and hopefully. We've, we've done that. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, by all means, feel free to send those to either Jane and or myself, and we look forward to speaking with you next time on our next Government Contract Series webinar. Thank you. And I just have one short clarification. When I had jumped in on one of Jeff's comments earlier, I had said the, the agency head could only waive it in national security interest. It's just national interest. <laughs> so I wanted to throw in that clarification. Um, and I also wanted to thank you for attending as well. And if you have any questions, Jeff and I will be here for a few more minutes afterward. Otherwise, we will see you all next time. Thanks again. Bye.